So um, welcome everyone. I just want to note that um, this event is being recorded. Um, during the um, presentation, you're more than welcome to place your comments and um, any questions that you might have into either the chat box or into the Q&A that you can find at the bottom. Um, as, it's, as it is being recorded, but as you can see at the very top of your screen, it is a webinar, so none of your voice or image is being captured. Um, welcome, my name is Eden Unlata uh, Foley. I am the art professor at West Shore Community College. Today, we are going to um, have a presentation by Professor Kellen Pazak um, on the current impact of automation on the American workforce. This presentation is a part of West Shore Community College's Humankind series. As a part of the series, we present lectures, exhibitions, performances, and more. Every year, we pick a topic to study, and this year's topic is movement. For uh, more information and upcoming events um, in the Humankind series, you may visit humankindwscc.org. And if you give me a second, I will go into the chat and post that so all of you can access it. It has been posted to the chat now. In this presentation, uh, Professor Petzak will address how future workers will need to be more skilled, regardless of what industry that they're in, and how humans will be working alongside advanced technical systems. Professor Petzak is currently a professor of information technology at West Shore Community College here in Michigan. His bachelor's degree is in computer information systems with a major in computer programming from Davenport University. He has a master's degree in cybersecurity and information assurances from Western Governors University. And he's currently pursuing a multidisciplinary PhD integrating psychology, technology, and learning sciences at Grand, at Grand Canyon University. He has worked in the industry as a backend software developer writing enterprise resource planning software, ERP software, um, as well as a database administrator, administrator for, healthcare, for the healthcare sector. He is certified in ethical hacking and computer hacking forensic investigations. And besides technology and teaching, Professor Petzak enjoys studying topics such as philosophy and spirituality. You might see him around Ludington, Michigan on his fat tire bike or playing basketball. His favorite thing to do um, is to spend time outdoors with his wife and his young children. To relax, Professor Petzak takes saunas most days of the week and reads in his free time. Professor Petzak, the floor is yours. All right, thanks for that introduction, Eden. Um, yeah, the, I put the sauna in there to hopefully put a little humor in, in, in my bio. Um, so let's get to it. Let me share my screen here. I wanna thank everybody for coming, first of all. Uh, I hope you find this information useful. Uh, it's very important in our current, in the current day and age, uh, especially when we're looking at uh, where our young people are going to be employed or what we might do if we wanna change careers. So let me share my screen. Okay. So we're looking at the current impact of automation in the American workforce. And we will start off by discussing Moore's law. So Moore's law um, is a law that states the number of transistors in a microchip doubles every two years. And uh, this is important because it essentially means that our computers get twice as good or they have twice the computing power uh, every two years. Uh, and this will build into um, why we are currently going into, or we currently are in the fourth industrial revolution or the digital revolution. Um, so as we can see, it's been a short time span uh, since we have developed computers, uh, computing technologies in comparison obviously to the, the grandscape of things. Um, and, Times have moved fast. Uh, 
I sure, I'm sure a lot of you in your life have noticed the dramatic change in the way humans live. Uh, and this is due to Moore's law. Um, and Moore's law essentially sets us on somewhat of an exponential curve. There are some people that, that say, we can look here at the curve right here. Um, in this slide, we're looking at it computing technology. So Moore's law is the idea that the transistors double. That shows that our computing power doubles and our computers get better. We have better technology and it exists on that exponential type curve. Um, so what's really interesting uh, is if you look at your own life, like I was born in the, in the 90s. And so I was a 90s kid. We didn't have a computer. Um, when I was little, then we got in the late nineties, you got that dial up internet where you go, ee -oh, ee -oh, and you, you go through that. And then by the end of high school, we all have iPhones in our pockets that are connected to the internet everywhere. And now we look at, uh, 12 years, 13 years after that, we can see how technology is becoming integrated into our lives. So there are a lot of sociological questions, um, philosophical questions on how this technology is affecting us. We're going to, it's out, outside of our scope. I'd really like to talk about it. It's outside of our scope. We're going to be looking at how it impacts the workforce, but um, it's really interesting uh, to think about it that way. And so, as I stated, we're in a, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, opposed in this digital, it, you can also call it the digital revolution. And basically Moore's law from the early 1900s going up till now, uh, which we're really ramping up. Um, and the important thing to think about when we think about this, this curve is that things aren't going to slow down. So I just described my life. You can look at your life and see how technology has changed. And the interesting thing is it's probably not gonna slow down anytime soon because as your computing power gets more powerful, you can develop better technology and it's gonna make more changes to all of our lives and the places in which we work. So it's important for us to step back every once in a while and think about these things and think about how they're affecting us and think about how we're going to adapt to this, this change. And in discussing the fourth industrial revolution or the digital revolution that we're currently in, there are some major components. The first component is automation. And automation is the idea that robots and automated mechanical devices can do things that humans used to do. Um, we saw during the industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution when machines first were incorporated into society, how much that shook society up. There was a mass, there was a mass transfer of population from a, an agrarian type society to an urban society. And that caused a lot of societal strife. It caused a lot of technological progression. But in this presentation, I wanna look at our lives and how, look and try to understand, try to look at the big picture and think about how we might adapt or how our younger generation might adapt to these, these changes so that we can combat any of the negative influences uh, that might come from such dramatic change, which there are a lot of positive. I'm not, I'm not a Luddite in any way, but it's important that we look and we take a step back and we we look at the past and we see how things are going. So automation. We've seen in factories for uh, decades now of these automated type robots in factories, building cars, the assembly line will initially started with humans, but then they incorporated robots. And now we have smarter robots that can do more things. Uh, So there are gonna be a couple of videos that I'm gonna show just to demonstrate some of the technologies that are, are new, that are going to be revolutionizing industry. So here is the first, and this one is on automation. Amazon, 
and that's really quiet. So I am going to, one second, I'm gonna change my, Meet the robots of Amazon, engaged in a computerized choreography designed for peak efficiency in delivering the things you order online. What robotics helps us to do is condense the field to maximize the storage and the efficiency. In other words, the robots allow Amazon to pack 50% more items into the same space, navigating the narrow lanes to find the item you ordered and deliver it to a human who sends it on its way. More goods, more quickly, and we also make the robots do the heavy lifting and the work. In all, there are 2,000 of these mobile robots with 37,000 storage pods. They'll store and then distribute 20 million products along 14 kilometres of conveyor belts. The robots will also work alongside 1,500 human employees. They're guided by 38,000 of these QR codes, each placed by hand. They can't be more than a third of a millimetre out. Now, these robots might be here in Western Sydney, but their reach could very well be Australia-wide. In fact, products leaving here, travelling 12 hours north, 12 hours south, could cover 85% of the Australian population. It's all housed in the Southern Hemisphere's largest warehouse. The 200,000 hectares on four levels took years to plan, but just 17 months to build. The empty space here now will eventually look like a similar Amazon center overseas with improvements for Australian operations. The last year has changed the way we shop and this kind of facility is only the start of what's going to come across Australia and across the world because we are relying on that style of home delivery for everything. The blur of robots, conveyors and lights are all still being tested with the center expected to be operating early in the new year. Eddie Meyer, Nine News. All right. And so we can look at that. The guy at the end talks about how that this is just starting. This is just these, these types of warehouses where we have these automated processes are, are just, you know, they're, they're ramping up and they're going to ramp up faster as the technology progresses. We saw that curve with Moore's Law. And we have to think about the impacts of that. So Let's keep on rocking and rolling. Uh, Meet the robots of Amazon, engage. The next thing that is relevant in the digital revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, is the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is the idea that the Internet can be connected uh, to our devices. So the first real inner, the, the first product that was widely used um, that you could consider as the internet of things, as one of the internet of things is our cell phones. Um, it's a phone that's connected to the internet. It has a computer built in. There are a lot more, as you all are starting to see, as you have seen the past decade, uh, there are a lot more of these devices being incorporated into our life. So if we look at the internet of things, that is also on a huge growth. Um, and that's relatively relatively recently. Um, but you see that exponential curve as our as our computing compile, as our computing power doubles, our devices become more ubiquitous. They take a bigger part in our lives. They they uh, they make a huge impact. And there are a ton of different types of Internet of Things. So anything from your fridge to your microwave to your car uh, that now have the Internet built in, that is, the type, that is a type, those are all types, or those are all categorized as the Internet of Things. And as you can connect those to the Internet, you can then take data from those. You can aggregate that data. You can make processes more efficient. You can track your health. You can, you can do a multitude of different things. They now put... Um, they now put computers within pacemakers that go in people's hearts. In every industry, uh, in the vast majority of industry, the Internet of Things is, is going to start being more prevalent in our lives. And one of the things, one of the interesting things, um, or one of the interesting topics in the Internet of Things are smart cities. And so we'll watch this short video on smart cities and we'll keep going. 
I love working with cities and municipalities. They want to really understand how can technology and intelligent connectivity help them solve real world problems, like not having enough water, pollution, transportation, traffic, the ability to communicate and manage their overall network. And it all starts with just really understanding kind of the art of the possible, just changing the way that they think about their own departments. You're no longer the lighting department. You're the connectivity department because that light pole needs to do more than just light. What if it had a small cell on it, solve density issues for a new up and coming area in a city? So now all of a sudden the lighting department's working with the transportation department. The concept of being able to combine a lot of those different franchises into a single unit is really is something if I was to design a city, it would be intelligent enough to basically interact with its citizens and the government at the same time. So to me, an intelligent or smart city isn't so much about the type of technology or the type of connectivity that's being used, but it is about the fact that you've got data and information that's being shared across departments from department to department, as well as back to the citizens and then back again. So it's almost like a ever circling system. And eventually that makes the whole system even more efficient and effective and sustainable too. I think, you know, the, the unique thing about the work that we're doing in the IoT and industrial internet and smart cities, it's the fact that you have intelligent connectivity combining with human behavior. And that's really super transformative to really how we're going to live our lives. You are only limited by your imagination and what you know. So as we see, if we, if we, if we put centers, our sensors on our water management systems, if we put sensors on our lights, if we put sensors in our roads to and do all these things to track whether the roads are falling apart, whether the light bulb needs to be changed, what times the light bulb should be on. Um, if we look at our water quality and we find that the water quality is, is bad through one of these sensors, we have a thing called a smart city. And it's just another example of technology being incorporated into the workforce. And we're building up to, uh, to, to look at what we can do to sort of prepare ourselves to join that workforce. So some popular IoT devices. Things that you might see in and I'm giving examples of these, and this is showing that, that more and more IoT, IoT devices are being incorporated into our, into our society. Um, sorry for the ads. We'll scroll down here. But we have the, the Google Home voice controllers. We have the doorbells. We have the smart locks. We have the the little robots now that uh, entertain us. And maybe these aren't ubiquitous in your house, maybe you don't have a robot, but these things are coming into the fray and people are buying them and using them. Um, light switches, air quality monitors, a pollution monitor. And so we can see how these things are incorporated into our lives and they're incorporated into business. Um, and there's entire businesses built on the idea of building IoT. And if you're working for a city that is trying to become um, more smart, quote unquote, you will be having to work with this technology and knowing how to work with technology will, will better enhance your ability, obviously, to do that. Uh, just some weird, funny IoT devices. We'll, we'll click to a link here. Kellen, the um, videos are not showing up. And we're showing more example, examples of IoT devices built into our lives, um, just to show that the ubiquity of it um, entering into, the, into our lives. Oh, hold on one second. Oh, this is, yeah. So the smart cat litter tray, the smart snoring solution, smart home fragrance, the fragrance dispenser, um, smart deodorant, and I'm giving these examples to sort of show how this is incorporated in our daily lives. Obviously, in fact, in manufacturing, um, with inventory management, with uh, accounting, with sales, with marketing, all sorts of these types of things are being implemented. Um, but I'm just showing how much these things are, are starting to, to impact our lives. The smart belt, so you can stay in shape. 
Kellen, um, Kellen, the um, videos are not showing up on the other uh, flights. And you probably can see them that we are unable to see them. I apologize for that. You guys couldn't see. You couldn't see what I was showing the IT guys messing up with IT. Um, so we have, I was going down the list and showing these, these pictures of all these devices that are now incorporated into our lives. Um, just to continue to stress that technology isn't going away. It's going to continue to um, evolve and get more incorporated into the working world and our daily lives. And we need to be cognizant of that when we are starting to think about what we are going to do um, for our for future careers and um, and what we're going to do in life in general. So I had to share my entire screen to show those videos. So we'll pop back into this into the slide. And so the last big part of this fourth industrial revolution is artificial intelligence, or the three big three. So we have uh, automation, IoT, and artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is the idea that uh, the, a computer can learn um, and that it can, it can take in data, it can store that data, and then it can make decisions based on that data. And this is where once you incorporate artificial intelligence with automation and IoT, where things really start to ramp up, um, to where most of our manual repetitive jobs, or a lot of them at least, are going to be replaced by machines that can do the same thing, uh, barring some type of societal collapse. Uh, and just a, a couple cool tools here uh, auto, uh, with, that incorporate artificial intelligence and we're sort of continuing to grow um, to, to, to build this knowledge base of how technology is evolving and changing. Um, we'll check out something as simple as an automated fruit picker. And so we have these, these machines that can now do manual labor based, with, based on their ability to be automated and then incorporate artificial intelligence so that they can learn. And whether or not you're in farming, whether you're in business, uh, it's, there's a potential that there's going to be some of these systems incorporated into the workplace. Uh, and again, we're, we're we're, we're building a, a picture so that we can be more cognizant of that. Uh, not only do we have machines, but we have software. So auto, AI software, artificial intelligence software that can, that can create content, um, that can uh, automate processes intelligently. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at this other short video um, that demonstrating some software with artificial intelligence built in. Imagine if your website was fully personalized for every single visitor, intelligently created from your visitor data, freeing up resources to work on other things. 
Using the power of machine learning, Nostra has made this futuristic dream a reality. It couldn't be simpler to use. Using advanced generative AI, Nostra uses your existing content and creates an unlimited supply of additional content for your team to approve before it goes live. Then from the get-go, Nostra is ready to display personalized content to visitors. As time goes on, Nostra adjusts your website to mirror each visitor's sentiment and provide unique content ideally suited to them. Nostra links up with your favorite data sources. Its intuitive dashboard provides valuable insights into which generated content converts, and it continues to make new content day after day. Nostra, the first fully personalized intelligent content optimization platform. Work with us today. Please Google bread. And so it's not just just manual processes, but uh, somewhat, you know, processes that take some type of cog higher cognitive level of thinking uh, can be done with these these technologies. And And so here we're going to start discussing and looking at, you know, what, so how are all these technologies, we talked about the fourth industrial revolution that we're currently going through Moore's law, things are getting, um, technology is improving. Uh, so, so what do we do? What do we tell our young people? What do we do if we want to change, change our career? Um, how are these going to impact the workforce? Uh, and so we have a, we have a graph here by McKinsey uh, that shows that shows total it, it it shows the total hours of work um, done and categorizes it by physical and manual skills, basic cognitive skills, higher cognitive cognitive skills, social emotional skills, and technological skills. And so, from 2016 to 2030, we can see uh, that physical and manual skills the amount of those that are going to be done in the workforce are shrinking. Basic cognitive skills, the amount of jobs that required simply basic cognitive skills are shrinking. Uh, and then when you get into higher cognitive skills, things are growing. When you get into social emotional skills, the hours worked are going to be growing. And then in technical skills, we see growth there too. Um, and so the days of just getting a probably a high school education or at least in the way it's done now and landing a job where you'll be doing uh, manual labor or just basic cognitive skills they're going to be shrinking those opportunities are, are going to be going away uh so we need to tell our young people um teach our young people that in this new society, with this revolution, with this digital revolution, you have to develop some type of skill set that makes you valuable. Um, you will be working alongside of these automated systems. Uh, we saw we saw that in that last video how a content management system, the AI can write articles for a company. Um, so even simple, even even some. I guess you would call higher cognitive skills will be taken up. But generally speaking, the workforce is going to have high demands of technological skills and emotional skills going forward. And there will be less emphasis on manual skills, basic cognitive skills. If we look, this is also from McKinsey. If we look at this chart, we have, On the bottom axis, we have the extent of automation and AI adoption today. So these are industries that the percentage of them that are adopting AI technology. Um, so from going left to right, and then from bottom to top, we have the expected mismatch of skills. Uh, so whether you're in HR, customer service, and we've all had to deal with the automated uh, support service support services on whatever type of, you know, whether we're booking a hotel um, or anything like that, that's AI, that is automation and it's not going to slow down. 
as, as painful as it might be able to deal with something like that, but sales and marketing operations. So um, sending out mass marketing and pay, campaigns and automating that and getting in, getting data back from uh, people who have interacted with that marketing campaign. And then the AI automatically then uh, marketing to a set of uh, prospective customers. Um, we can see that a lot of industries are already currently being, being affected by AI. And if we look up here, if we go higher on the chart, we'll see there's a demand for people in data analytics that can work alongside these AI tech, technologies, IT and web design, R&D, product design. Um, so wherever you are, there's a lot of different facets of the workforce that are going to be working alongside uh, these systems that incorporate automation, IoT, and artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's just, um, that's just the way of the world. So we will, we will keep discussing that. It's a little strange um, having this, usually when I do this presentation, I have people looking at me and, uh, and um, interacting. So if I pause a little bit here and there, it's because I'm used to that back and forth. But anyways, um, if we look back, so we notice here that social, emo social and emotional skills and technological skills, there's going to be, there's going to be a high need for those in the future. Um, quantifiable skills. Technological skills are a little more quanti quantifiable than social and emotional, emotional skills um, or what we could call soft skills, uh, but they'll both be very important going into the future, into the future workforce. And so when we're, when we're looking at our young ones, when we're thinking about a career change, you want a competitive advantage in the digital age. Um, there was a study that Oxford did in 2013, that stated in the American workforce, uh, around 47% of all American jobs could be automated within the next couple decades. Um, that doesn't mean that robots are going to take all of our jobs, but that does mean that there'll be a shift in the types of skills people will need to be able to find good employment. Um, so tech skills are they offer to certain organizations and companies better accessibility, improved communication, increased productivity, integrated ser services, accelerated growth. Um, so having technical skills and then going and working and getting in the workforce will give you more opportunities. Um, be, just because we, we've looked at so far how ubiquitous these types of things are becoming within our society. Um, and then soft skills, like I said, a little harder to measure. But these soft skills are also really important because you're working alongside of these systems. Um, but when you incorporate, anyone who's tried to incorporate or who has implemented any of these systems, they know you get all this data back and then what do you do with it? Um, you have to organize teams to work around the data that these systems give you. Um, when these systems, you have to have people that, uh, that can run these systems and manage these systems. So soft skills are becoming very important too. With... Uh, the fact that they increase productivity, create stronger teamwork, uh, create more effective leaders, intent, uh, retention rate, employee morale, um, and ultimately, if you have a good company culture that uh, that has a lot of people with the soft skills that are necessary, the company works more efficient. The organization, and this is whether or not you want to go in. Um, to work for a company or whether you're going to start your own business or, you know, whether you're in healthcare. Um, these are the two big skills going forward that young people are going to need, tech skills and soft skills. Uh, and to, to demonstrate that a little bit more, um, MC Burning Glass did a study and it showed that students who major in English and literature who obtain project management, management skills can increase their entry level salary by 29%. Uh, a history major who's doing research, who's, who wants, um, who's, wor who's working, doing, needs, needs to do data analysis. And so if you have those skills, it can increase your, your salary by 38%. Uh, students who major in psychology, that obtain IT management skills can increase their salary level by 35%. If you're working um, in the healthcare industry, in the mental health industry, you'll see all these systems being set up to 
manage um, clients. Uh, same with education at the college here. We are implementing systems to improve retention rates, to do all these things. So if you want to follow your passion and do history, just think about going forward in the future, what the, what the, how you can give yourself a competitive advantage in this, in the current age. I don't know. And I'm going to answer a, a question here from is it a misconception that AI takes jobs out of the workforce? Could it be that AI and automation, automation are creating a demand for more positions that are lost? Yeah, and that, that's a good point. Um, I'm not saying that the robots are going to take all of our jobs, uh, like I said, but we do need to retool so that we can work with these systems. Um, and then the, there's, another, there's another here in the, the question and answer section. Uh, your chart showed high demand for data analytics skills, yet also had the highest automation. Yeah, they are incorporating these automated processes into these into jobs with data analytics. But yeah, that doesn't mean that it's taking away the, the human need for data analytics. That just means we need more people to then work with these systems uh, to then better organize this data. Uh, so if anybody has any, any questions and wants to say anything, uh, Just put them in the Q and A sec, the Q and A box. I'm not exactly sure how it shows up for you, but put it in the Q and A box if you have any other questions. Um, and so there are some, there are some interesting things we can do to sort of look at the job market. And so we're like, okay, we know that we know that AI and artificial intelligence and automation are going to be making a big impact on, on the working world. Uh, there's this interesting site that's reputable based off the Bureau of Labor Statistics. If we go to about, it's called, will robots take my jobs? Will, will robots take my job? And for our young people who are gonna be researching and trying to look at what's what uh, what they should do uh, as they enter the workforce, um, they'll have to do obviously a lot of there'll be a lot of research because things are changing so fast that you'll have to do this is an interesting uh, resource. And it talks about the 2013 study that showed that uh, uh, from Oxford that showed. It just discusses the 2013 study from Oxford showing that, you know, a lot of automation can happen to our jobs, but. Um, as, as it was pointed out, uh, it will create a lot of jobs as well. So there's, it's been featured in a lot of big names uh, and uses uh, statistics or uh, data rather from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting, interesting things here. So you can look at top job ratings, drill into, you know, what are hot jobs that aren't gonna be automated that have high salaries, what are jobs that have a high potential to be automated that don't have the best salary? Um, and this is just one tool and it's sort of, I bring up this tool just to, just to um, you know, promote the idea that we're going to have to do research for our young people or our young people have to do research um, when they're thinking about what they want to do and thinking about what skill sets they'll need in the digital age uh, and what happens if we pop in here to occupational therapists. So not a lot of automation risk, uh, huge growth, great wages. Uh, so just one resource that you can look into if you have young people or if you are interested in changing your career. Um, and nobody has a crystal ball and nobody can see into the future. But it's important to be thinking about these things. And so additional regional interests. So I put this in here to just to give more of an idea of what, you know, what is, what is going to be happening and to demonstrate further how automation is going to be affecting us. And we do have another Q and A, what is the effect of physical energy used by the human body that is lost in the health? 
of those. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the lack of, okay, so I see the, the lack of manual labor. Um, yeah, that's a great point. The lack of physically using our bodies. These are, that, that, that's exactly why we need to be talking about these things. Um, and we need to be cognizant if you're sitting at a desk all day long. And in my Intro to Computer Concepts course, we, we discuss computer ergonomics and we discuss, you know, getting away from the screen, um, getting outside, doing things. Uh, but it's just one more thing as we see this dramatic change. And that's the main point is there's a dramatic change. We need to shift and retool ourselves so that we can be successful um, in this changing world. And it's not like all manual labor will be gone. There's uh, like the trades, for instance, um, there's not a high, there's not a high percentage. There's not a high possibility that, you know, plumbers and electricians are going to be automated anytime soon. Um, and I'm not here to say that you should go get a computer science degree. I'm just saying that if you, there, there are a lot of industries that are changing quickly and having the technical skills and honing your technical skills while honing your social skills and your soft skills will give you the competitive advantage um, in the workforce. So good question. Um, so the additional resources, we'll just look at a couple more links here. And then we will, uh, we'll get out of here. Um, so just, just locally, you'll see more things in business impacting, um, impacting our current, our, our area. So Mc, McDonald's has introduced all the kiosks, you know, uh, within all their, within all their stores or the restaurants, they're also working on completely automating their drive throughs uh, so that there's no one at the drive through taking the order. They're also working on little robots that can flip hamburgers. Um, so just one of those sort of man, one of those, uh, you, you think of one of those jobs that might be gone, but then they'll need people to then support the support those robots, run those robots, fix those robots. Um, in Grand Rapids, and we got a little. In Grand Rapids, if you haven't seen these, they've had these down. Ago. Started They've had these little cars downtown um, for a while now. They're automated cars that have a little shuttle. There's no, there's no driver, um, just AI and automation driving people around town, downtown Grand Rapids. Uh, and so you'll see the, the driverless cars become, you know, that will have an impact on a lot of industry driverless cars. Uh, Walmart. Walmart's currently incorporating. Access limitless power with Element Pro. A, Design every part of your blog with Element. We have an ad. It could be a sorry. game changer for. So Walmart's incorporating these little robots that scan the shelves and do the inventory. So um, we can see sort of these these major companies incorporating, and we have local companies that um, are incorporating robots in our manufacturing industry. Um, as well. So we can see all of these things having impacts on all sorts of different industries. And we just need to be cognizant of that. <laughs> and I guess I've said that quite a bit, but um, I won't go anymore. We went 40, we went almost 50 minutes now. So I think you got the point that, you know, technology is going to keep increasing. It's going to keep uh, being more impactful in our lives. And if you have, we need to be thinking for our young ones and people changing what skills we'll need uh, in the future workforce. So uh, thank you everybody for listening. I really appreciate it. Kellen, um, in the, the Q&A, um, as people would like to um, ask questions, I just wanna remind um, everyone to please put their um, questions in the Q&A or in the chat box, either one. Um, I wanted to ask one question. How do you think um, the school system, both K through 12 and the universities, like our college should, should be changing their messaging to um, encourage students to be looking at some of this? I think, I think getting this information out there is, you know, um, is, is the big thing. It's our, I, these things are scary because people don't like change, right? 
mm-hmm. but it's it's inevitable it's going to happen um so getting this messaging out there and saying hey you can you can do and you can follow your passion you can be a creative right brain person um but you can also learn some it management or data analytics skills that could give you more uh mm-hmm. opportunities within your career uh and i think just the me- just getting it out there and explaining these these types of things is where do you think there's a dis- dis- disconnect between um the current uh, college um uh, enrollment and um a- and this topic i mean th- as you pointed out this is not going away yet um universities and colleges are are are, are uh, severely struggling with um with enrollment numbers yeah i mean that's a that's a sociological question um and with the pandemic, that that's hard to gauge, right? And then with the, so it's hard it's hard to understand exactly what the pandemic's doing because we haven't had this happen in a hundred years. Um, it is, it is um, the the economy and the statistics on that where we have a you know we have a high level of job openings and markets are great and housing prices are up. Uh, that's definitely having an impact on it. You'll see that, as I'm sure you know, college enrollment goes up when there's a recession or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, I, I think the, uh, yeah, and we'll leave it at that. I mean, we're just in turbulent times. And I think that's, I, it's hard to, it's hard to pinpoint that exactly. I think it's the economy. It's the, it's the pandemic. It's these young kids who did their last year of high school remotely. And, mm-hmm. you know, that can't have a positive impact on college enrollment. I would imagine. Uh, do you have to, do you have thoughts on that Eden? <laughs> what? Say it again. Do you have thoughts on that? <laughs> Oh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I want to keep it uh, okay. focused Fair on enough. technology. Fair there is actually a couple questions that came in. How can we expect young people to attend community college, colleges and four years universities if the cost of tuition just keeps multiplying every year um, when they can go out and get a job now um, and not be in big time debt? And as you were pointing out, this is actually an important um, equation. Um, you asked my opinion on this. Um, I'll just quickly state it. I, I think some of this is short-sighted, but I'll leave you leave it to you, Kellen, to give a more in-depth answer. Yeah, no, I, I that, I mean that you hit the nail on the head. Things are good right now. Um, things aren't always good. You always want to give yourself a skill set uh, that will make you uh, mm-hmm. more valuable to an institution. Um, and there are, you know, community college, the tuition. That's what's that's one of the great things about a community college is because we're designed for the community so that our students don't have to get a lot of debt. A lot of students get financial aid um, at, at our institution. We have a, a promise scholarship where any student that graduates within our um, from a high school within our within our county can go here for free. Uh, the college here and I can't speak for all colleges. The college here uh, supports students financially when it can, if they run into financial trouble. Um, So I don't think we can categorize universities and community colleges all in one. Um, There are now, there are now alternative forms of education, like online education Mm -hmm. popping up and and the private industry is using AI and things to to teach students. Um, So I do think that that generation Z, the young kids, they have heard, you know, you don't want to get into a ton of debt. Um, You don't want to do that. Uh, So looking at, and that's one of the things is when you're, when you're looking forward is, you know, maybe I should go to a community college for two years. Um, Maybe I can get an an applied associates and get a job right after community college, or, you know, there's different strategies. There's different schools that are implementing, there's different online schools that are implementing um, more cost effective. Um, they're, they're, they're structured more cost effectively. Um, so, and that's all just research you can do. It's, in, it's, it's, uh, sort of individual specific, but, uh, that's what I would say is there are a lot of scholarships. There are a lot of community colleges. There are a lot of opportunities to, 
to, to cut corners and save money, not cut corners, but to save money mm -hmm. uh, when going to get um, prepared for the workforce. There's another question. Um, what is the effect of physical, oh, sorry. Um, what is the project errors in these systems that can cause an injury to a person such as a driverless cars? Yeah, yeah, and that, that's always, whenever I do this presentation, I usually do this presentation um, in front of high schoolers, and that's often, that often comes up. Well, what happens when the Tesla crashes um, and, and hurts somebody? And I mean, and that's the big thing is the driverless cars, the, the AI and the sensors and everything, um, you know, it, what happens when a human crashes? And, you know, we have, that's one of the most dangerous things that we do in our lives is we get in cars and we drive around with a bunch of people um, who might be tired, who might be on drugs, who might be, you know, all yeah. doing all sorts of things with these machines. Um, statistically, I think going forward, you'll see that it's actually safer uh, with driverless cars. Um, as the technology continues to get better. Uh, and with workplace accidents, I mean, if you look, and that, that is a good point, because in the industrial revolution, you had child labor, you had long hours where people were getting, you know, hurt in the factories. And so that's something to think about. Um, but with, uh, especially with the driverless cars, I don't think it's something that um, is going to increase the death rate of motor accidents. Um, if anything, it'll, it'll probably decrease it. Switching gears here, there's a question. What is an ethical hacker? Um, do you have to go to college for that? Yeah, yeah. So an ethical hacker is a cybersecurity specialist. And when I talk to the high schools, I talk about the cybersecurity is one of these industries that's blowing up. Uh, they need a lot of cybersecurity professionals because, you, as you can imagine, if you have 10 IoT devices in your house, those can all theoretically get hacked. And then those people can get into your home network and they can steal your data. Um, uh, cybersecurity between countries. Countries are constantly hacking each other um, and businesses uh, constantly have to worry about getting hacked. So a hacker is someone who understands information technology and computer programming who then can go around uh, defenses within a computer network or a computer system and cause havoc, whether they're stealing data, whether they're, um, they're, whether they're stealing identities, um, there's also there's a there's a plethora of different things that they can do to negatively impact somebody. So an ethical hacker is someone who learns how to hack, but then works for the good guys and tries to stop the bad guys from then hacking into their institution. Um, yes, typically I'd say you, in most cases you'll have a four year degree. Um, we have some programs at our institution at the associates level where we have ethical hacking course. We have an ethical hacking course. Um, and there are some two-year degrees where you can get uh, ethical hacking. Uh, so you can get, you know, the skills in ethical hacking. Um, so yeah, typically, typically you'll be college educated. Um, you can get certifications. Uh, like I have a couple that you may be able to get your foot in the door in the industry there. Um, but that's generally, yeah, what an ethical hacker is. And there's a huge demand for, for folks like that, that, that have those skills. Um, another question is you um, you have human error, going back to um, the previous question about systems causing injury. Um, uh, just how much do we know or hear about computer errors? Yeah, well, uh, when that Tesla crashed, there was a Tesla that crashed last year and caused an accident and it was, it was blown up in the news. Um, and I'm not defending technology anyway. This, this presentation is just to say, technology's here. It's going to stay unless there's a societal collapse. Um, whether or not we like technology is sort of irrelevant. Um, and whether or not we like these changes, so what I wanna do is just analyze the situation so that we can do the best that we can to live good lives with this technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, how much is that is that brought up? Well, there are a lot of there are a lot of if if something happens with it, and the cars are the big one because that's the most um, evident thing that we see is we if we see a driverless car, um, everyone's like, whoa! Um, obviously, driving is dangerous. We want, really want machines driving. Um, it's brought up. It, it, it's not hidden. Um, <laughs> 
so I, that, that's all I can say to that. I didn't, I, I haven't done a ton of research on workplace accidents with, with, uh, with cars or automation. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. The, it's brought up, um, these technologies are safe uh, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, there's another question asking if VPNs prevent hacking. Yeah, yeah, they can help. Um, so a VPN is a virtual private connection. It's, it's a piece, it's a software that you can download on your computer that essentially encrypts all of your computer's traffic that goes out to the, the World Wide Web. And so it does things like hide your IP address, um, it hides your traffic. So it, it makes it much less likely that uh, you get your identity stolen um, mm -hmm. and, and things along those lines. Uh, so yeah, th th that's a useful tool, especially if you're going in, you know, if you're going to McDonald's and using their Wi-Fi. If you're ever on an open Wi-Fi, you want to be using a VPN because anybody on that open Wi-Fi uh, potentially could have access to your, your technical information going over the wire or through the air. So VPNs helpful in that regard. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about um, training for people who have long since graduated from college or has long since left high school. Um, this has been something that has been coming up in the last um, you know, five or six years um, about particularly a, um, in, an audience of like 45 and older who have felt like they've been left behind with all the technical changes. And um, that has itself spurred a lot of uh, political anger um, or has uh, played into a lot of people who have um, ridden that um, uh, wave you know, for a while there was a, a debate about, well, if you don't have a factory job, you should learn how to code. And the counter um, argument was, well, what, what if I don't want to code? Um, so what might be some solutions to the folks who are in that 45 and older um, generation and feel like they've been left behind? Like, well, what, what are some of their options without going to a four-year college? Yeah, so like we stated before, um, there are a lot. So certifications are big, mm -hmm. uh, whether you get Google just released a whole suite of certifications that you can get, um, which actually I'm trying to or, uh, implement in my coursework um, to supplement it. So there's certifications online that you can do online uh, at the college. Uh, we have courses uh, to then get you prepared. And it's not like, um, yeah, the learn to code. Uh, it's not like that. It's not like you have to just learn to code. But if you if you can get certified in some type of, of technical area, even if it's project management mm -hmm. um, or if it's data analytics, which or um, our UX UI design, uh, these smaller certifications that don't take as long, uh, whether you get them at the community college level or whether you get them online through some through some um, a large larger institution such as Google. Uh, there are those options. You just have to be willing to go out there uh, and, and take the time to, to learn them. And is there a central place where someone could find that information? I, I feel like most of the messaging of this was lost in the last decade when, you know, uh, mining jobs and factory jobs increasingly disappeared and got automated. Um, and like in Ludington, for example, we are actually a, a pretty decent sized industrial town, but most of the, uh, the jobs are automated. You know, yep. there's very few factory uh, jobs. Um, so like, how would one find out about that? Like, where should people start looking? I think this is one, one of the big problems. Like a lot of people lose their job and they don't even know what, what the first thing they should be doing to level up their skills. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. And that's one thing I've been trying to do at, in, our, in our community is um, I've started advising and you get these appointments of, yeah, veterans, um, mm -hmm. kind of older people. Uh, and so reaching out to like that, that's what a community college is for, is for the, that type of, and depending on what you did and what you want to do. Um, I, I don't know, like a site off the top of my head. I mean, you could Google uh, you could look up, you know, what are the, what are the hot jobs, but you know, if you don't know what, what they're, if you don't, if you don't have, um, you know, if you're starting from square one, one that might sound, um, you know, intimidating. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, reach out to your local community college, reach out to, to um, what's the Michigan Works, reach out to these resources 
that's what I would say to at least get a start. And here at the college, that's, that's what we try to do is mm -hmm. to, to try to give that information. Yeah. Hence this presentation. Hence why we do this. <laughs> why we go out to why I go to high schools and do the same presentation just to get this information out there. Mm -hmm. Folks, are there any questions that you'd like to ask Kellen? Professor Petzak? Let's see, something came in. Church. Dylan is thanking you for the great info. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just saying that he's glad he's retired. <laughs> yeah. Is there any further questions, uh, comments you would like to make? No, I just appreciate everybody listening. Like I said, it's a little, I'm used to doing this to an in-person audience. So doing this Zoom call, when you don't have any feedback, uh, mm -hmm. it's a little bit different. So I, there was a couple of times where I was a little, uh, it's like, yeah, yeah, it you is what it is. So. Interaction. Yeah, yeah. We need human interaction. Um, so uh no just thank thank you everybody for coming i hope this was uh good information i hope it's helpful i hope you know if you have a young one or if you're looking to change careers this was this was useful um my information is on west shore site if anybody ever had any questions about any any of this if you wanted more um information specific information to what you're doing um i'm more than happy to help um and this video will be up on our youtube channel in the coming weeks so if you wish to uh, revisit some of the um, presentation and um, hear some of the comments, um, please revisit our YouTube channel, uh, West Shore Community College's um, um, YouTube channel in the coming weeks. It will take us about two or three weeks before we can get it up. Thank you very much, Kellen. Thanks, Amy. Great. Um, And thank you everyone for uh, participating this evening. Um, if there isn't any more questions, um, we'll end the session. Thank you. I'm gonna stop recording.